So welcome to the second lecture in Free University of Brighton philosophy class. Uh, Hell is other people, existentialism in a time of crisis. This is a 10 week course where we're looking primarily at Kierkegaard um, and we'll be focusing on Kierkegaard on the book Fear and Trembling. And then on the second half of the course, we'll be looking at Sartre. And we'll be looking at extracts from Sartre from various different places. So this first half of the course is all going to be focused around uh, Kierkegaard. And um, there's a few kind of important things that we need to begin to think of. Uh, and I mentioned some of these last week when we talked about subjects, objects, and singulars and universals. And in particular, when I talked about the two kind of questions that we need to sort of perhaps think about, how do I find myself in my knowledge and how do I find myself in relationship to truth or in relationship to reason in particular? And both of these questions I, are, 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 are kind of aimed at enabling us to bring ourselves into the frame when we begin to think philosophically. And this is one of the key, um, I suppose, lessons or key concepts that existentialism tries to develop is to bring ourselves into the reasoning and bring ourselves into the space in which we are working as thinkers um, and to bring ourselves into the space of philosophy to not allow philosophy to be abstract and out um, out of this world and, and somehow you know um, somehow not not relevant to our everyday lives existentialism wants to make thinking thought philosophy relevant to everyday lives it wants to counter the abstraction it finds inside philosophy and it wants to do this by um, bringing us back into our own frame of thinking and knowing and asking what kind of what kind of involvement um, we have with our knowledge um, and what it says about us what kind of things um, and uh, the way in which we relate to our knowledge says what it says about who we are and how we are now, obviously, in the moment, um, in the situation of crisis, obviously, this is, of course, existentialism in a time of crisis. We have a very strange relationship to knowledge. <clears throat> it's knowledge, after all, that generates the lockdown, the quarantine measures, the scientific kind of controls uh, or the scientific justification for the controls that are placed upon our lives and which most of us welcome in many ways. Obviously, some people resist this, but many, many people are welcoming these. And what they're doing, in a sense, is welcoming a kind of knowledge um, into the space of their lives to to a very intimate extent, to, a, to the extent in which it, it changes the relationships they have with their families, for example, or with very close friends and lovers. Um, and so knowledge here is, is coming from the outside and determining elements of our everyday life, um, and we are submitting willingly to this. Um, now, some people perceive that to be simply uh, a bad thing, um, Others recognise what they think of as the self-disciplining of, of uh, reason. Um, so to be reasonable, you have to kind of submit to a certain amount of, of rational knowledge. But in whatever way you respond to the sort of relationship to knowledge, the reality is, is that it is having a massive effect on our lives. It impacts on our existence. Quite basic forms of existence, very embodied forms of existence, such as the capacity to touch or the capacity to feel um, and so there's a relationship that existentialism has uh, to knowledge, um, a relationship where it places the individual and the subjects at the heart of um, what it is to know and what knowing does to us that is kind of relevant to this particular moment in time. Having said that, this is also a course in philosophy, so we're trying to, um, we're trying to explore the ideas on their own terms. We're trying to, we're trying to explore what the philosopher say in this case Kierkegaard has done that um, might be of interest and we're trying to um, learn how to think that's one of the things that philosophy tries to teach us is in some ways to learn how to think so um, obviously that involves a slightly drier that's uh, <laughs> a slightly more kind of academic let's let's put it like that a slightly more academic way of, of dealing with things for example by looking at the way in which different philosophers use different methods and i've already mentioned last week that existentialism in some ways is a kind of development of a particular method a method of as it were what i called last week poetic reason more specifically for kierkegaard um there's this particular kind of method that is developed uh, in the course of Fear and Trembling and a book that goes alongside it called Repetition, which we're not really going to look at at the moment. Um, but in this particular book, um, and this is this is the subtitle of the book, 
Uh, Kierkegaard wants to develop this thing that he calls the dialectical lyric. Now, the dialectical lyric is his way, as it were, of taking um, taking the Hegelian dialectic and the Platonic dialectic and transforming them as a method um, in, for his own ends. And we'll 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 get to those ends. Um, they're deeply connected to what we called last week indirect communication. Um, and they'll begin to bring us to the heart of how it is that Kierkegaard thinks that we can bring this subject into their relationship, to bring them into an awareness of their relationship to knowledge and to reason. Now, the dialectical lyric, this is to quote Kierkegaard, it, the dialectical lyric exp is in the sense Kierkegaard's way, it's his name for the way of presenting what's going on inside uh, fear and trembling. Now, as it happens, this, this particular quote comes from Problemata 3, towards the end of the book. Um, and he says here, Before proceeding to the story of Abraham, I shall summon a pair of poetic individualities. With the power of dialectics, I shall hold them at the apex, and by disciplining them with despair, I may prevent them from standing still, so that in their anxiety, they may possibly be able to bring something or other to light. So this, the idea, particularly in this notion of, of more than one individuality here, this kind of relationship between individualities, the dialectic um, here is, is a kind of relationship to dialogue or a conversation between these different individualities. Um, in bringing these individualities sort of to the fore, placing them into some sort of tension or, you know, placing them into relationship and then allowing that relationship, as it were, to figuratively express um, what it is that he wants to uh, present in the text rather than using a series of straight dry concepts and arguments to, to enable figurative expression um, an expression that connects to our imagination and connects to our emotions uh, an expression that draws from us not so much a kind of dry thought as as a warm thought a thought that's embodied a thought that comes from our own lives and it is this that he thinks is going to enable the presentation of some kinds of ideas some kinds of ideas now there's going to be complications here which we'll kind of get to um but it's also important to realize that there's in this method uh not not some kind of scientific certainty or, or, or clarity. There there is in this method something far closer to what we would find in the poet or in the poem or in the drama or in the play or in the novel. There's this kind of encounter with real life, encounter with existence um, that uh, Kierkegaard wants to be able to present in such a way that we don't um, have any option other than be caught and gripped by the particular account of existence. Now, in, in your everyday life, um, a philosophical question may come and go quite briefly inside your mind. Um, but obviously, the idea for Kierkegaard, particularly with regard to this question of faith, is that the philosophical question, if it's going to en engage us as a subject, um, can't just be something that's kind of fleetingly able to float through our minds, passing through um, and, and just passing on. It needs to be something that's capable of gripping us. And he, in some sense, might be said to get to this position in part because of his own life, in part because of his own biography. Now, there is a huge problem here, um, and I'll just quickly outline that. This problem is the following. Some readings of Kierkegaard read everything that he writes, in particular around a particular sort of time, which involves fear and trembling. Um, they, they, they read what he writes as though it's a kind of hidden autobiographical expression of a particular incident. Um, and that was a very common reading for a long time, to read Kierkegaard as kind of expressing some hidden thing, some hidden message um, that was specifically aimed at a particular person. Um, that's, that reading is, 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 is less important nowadays, perhaps, and people take more seriously um, the work itself rather than the biography behind it. Having said that, it's important to know this biography. So the biography fundamentally is is connected to this particular moment of Kierkegaard's life when he's involved with a woman called Regine Olsen. 
Um, now, the poetic individualities that he mentioned when he talked about the dialectical lyric, these are going to be um, poetic individualities of a particular kind of story that we'll get to in a moment, but they could also, in a sense, be the poetic individualities that he perceives himself and regime to be. Um, he is engaged to regime, um, and then shortly before the wedding, um, he calls off the engagement, and then he behaves in a particular way in order to try and, as it were, um, break regime out of any relationship of love to him. So he behaves like a bit of a bastard. Um, now, he struggles with regime. He struggles with the idea of marriage because he sim somehow thinks, um, or he believes, he's, he's com convinced uh, that marrying regime is going to bring disaster upon her because of the kind of person he is. And so in a sense, he kind of is, he, he, he articulates his biographical moment of, of splitting with regime as one of saving her. Now in Problemata 3, um, there's an interesting example that kind of ref perhaps reflects Kierkegaard's own position more clearly than anything else. And this is uh, the story of a, of a wedding. It's a story of a wedding that's called off because of a public prophecy. Uh, it's a story that Kierkegaard takes out of Aristotle's politics. And it's a story um, essentially of, of a young couple in Greece um, going to the temple to be married and when they get there the augur or the public prophecy um, uh, the public prophet, prophet prophetess the public prophecy uh, tells the husband that essentially the wedding will bring disaster upon him and so he's faced with the situation of calling off the wedding um, and he calls off the wedding because of this public prophecy of disaster now, this, this analogy here between the, the story that Kierkegaard's picked up and, of course, the own situation in his own life with a wedding that he called off is um, perhaps, you know, unavoidable uh, um, in terms of bringing us to a biographical reading of, of Fear and Trembling and, as I say, of the other work that goes alongside it, Repetition. It, as I say, they, that, the conflict between the, read, the biographical reading and, as it were, the, the more text-focused reading um, is important it's worth bearing in mind it's important not to reduce everything in fear and trembling to just you know a hidden message perhaps um, but it's also important to recognize that that plainly there's some key motivational relationship um, to a particular situation a particular incident um, in his own life that he's trying to think through and that may tell us something about what what fear and trembling is in the case of the story of the wedding what we have is um, what Kierkegaard thinks we have are three options. Um, we have the option to remain silent and get married. We, option, we have the option to remain silent and not get married. And we have the option to speak. And he's talking about the incident initially with the, um, the lovers in Greece. Uh, but he's making a very in interesting point during the course of his discussion. And he says, if the will, had, if the will of heaven had not been declared to him by an augur, if it had come to his knowledge quite privately, if it had entered into a purely private relation to him, then we are in the presence of the paradox. So just to make this clear, so so when the person the when the when the groom gets the information from the augur, it's it's a kind of um the augur is a public institution in Greece. Um, people believe in it, people use it. It's complete common sense to, to take seriously what the augur says. Obviously, in our current context, for example, that wouldn't be. But in the context of Greece and what's happening to the groom, that announcement um, that the wedding will bring disaster is a kind of public property, Kierkegaard says. Um, it's a kind of uh, announcement everyone can understand, not just uh, not just the husband, but the wife, or the, or the wife-to-be, um, the fiancé. Um, but also everyone around them. So the disaster that is the calling off of the wedding um, is understandable. It's reasonable. It's it's capable of being explained by uh, something that's happened to the groom and that everyone can understand. It's it's public property, that explanation. But Kierkegaard is interested not so much in the situation in which it's public property. He's particularly interested in what happens when um, when the situation is a private matter. And this brings us to the heart of what 
fear and trembling is about because the relationship that Abraham has to God, the relationship that he has to faith, is fundamentally for Kierkegaard going to be a, 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 you know, connected to this relationship to what we might call a private matter or something that isn't capable of being communicated. Um, and so the actions that Abraham takes uh, are outside of the realm of communication. They're outside of the realm of the universal. They're outside of the realm of the public. Um, but they're going to be judged by that realm. They're going to, as it were, be noticed by that realm. And the public realm is going to hold, hold the person accountable, um, even if they're incapable of giving an account precisely because um, the motivating factor, the reason for their actions, is um, Kierkegaard wants to say a private matter, um, and so only in cases like the the Greek wedding that's being called off, where everything is a kind of in the public realm and in the realm of common sense, only there can we actually have a kind of explanation given. In the realm of the private, it's incapable, it's impossible to give an explanation completely for what's. Um, for one's actions and obviously this is going to have a kind of interesting um, implications for what it is to be a subject and what it is to be an individual what it is as it were to have at the core of our subjectivity um, a privacy uh, a silent space a space that's that's inaccessible a space that's singular and not universal So to go back to those questions, how do you find yourself in relationship to your knowledge? How do you find yourself in relationship to reason? <laughs> Starting with the first one, how do you find yourself in relationship to your knowledge? Well, let's explore that a little bit more by expanding it now. Um, how do you find yourself in relationship to your knowledge if the knowledge you have places you in a paradox? Um, and at the moment, we can just think of this paradox as in terms of being motivated by a private matter that you can't express publicly. That's, that's, we, can, we can explore it a bit more, but that's essentially the paradox that we're beginning to work with. Now, if I wanted to answer this for myself, if I wanted to answer this question of how do I find myself in relationship to my knowledge, particularly when I'm in a place of paradox, um, a situation that we might say uh, describes um, Kierkegaard in relationship to regime, um, Kierkegaard in relationship to the, the wedding that he calls off. But if I wanted to answer that question for myself, then perhaps thinking about someone else placed in a paradox uh, is going to be useful. And plainly for fear and trembling, um, that's, that's the way in which the case of Abraham is presented to us. Abraham is presented to us as placed in a paradox. And so... There's a kind of idea that somehow there might be a kind of analogic, anal analogical reasoning that we can develop here. If we can learn from, if we can reason about, if we can think through the case of Abraham, um, then it's not so much the question of faith and God that we're thinking through. We're actually thinking through this relationship to knowledge when we're placed in a paradoxical position, when we're placed in a, in a paradox in relationship to knowledge. And so any situation in which we're placed inside paradox, inside in particular, a paradox of communicability, a paradox in which there's a kind of privacy or a subjectivity to my motivations, to my actions, that is uh, in, almost in principle impossible to communicate publicly. When placed in those paradoxes, um, the way in which uh, we think about Abraham can enable us to think about that by analogy. Now, there's another point that's going to be crucial here to, to begin to think about and in the second part of this lecture I'll briefly go through some of the structure of the text before looking a little bit in the third part uh, at some of the themes but there's, before we finish the first part and we'll have a break in a moment um, we need to we need to deal with a very very important kind of uh, um, elephant in the room which is that we can't really talk about Kierkegaard simply by reading Fear and Trembling um, not least because Fear and Trembling itself is not written, or well, it's not presented as being written by Kierkegaard. He uses this pseudonymous authorship, and he uses it continuously through uh, a large, a wide range of his works. And so it's not an accidental um, situation in Fear and Trembling, it's part of his method. Um, and so if that method is what we call the dialectical lyric, then it's not simply about the characters that are figuratively presented to us and figuratively express certain situations, certain existential situations, such as living in a paradox or, you know, knowing in a paradoxical situation. Um, we're also uh, we're also kind of 
having to pay attention to the, the very framework, the staging of this figurative expression, the staging of the dialectical lyric just as much as the actual content. Um, another staging of Fear and Trembling is that it is written by someone called Johannes de Silencio or John the Silent. And there's, there is actually a Saint John the Silent, uh, a hermit. And there's another saint that was a hermit that may have been the inspiration for Kierkegaard. Um, I can't remember the second, the name of the second saint at the moment, but there are, you know, there is a kind of saintly Christian saint kind of relationship that we might think of to that name, John the Silent. Um, and in the A to Z of Kierkegaard, which is a secondary text, there is a sort of, there is a claim, for example, that there's a silent communication of the motive behind Kierkegaard's need to sacrifice his love for Regine Olsen within Fear and Trembling, um, and that John the Silent is kind of expressing, you know, the silent um, communication in, in his name, in John the Silent's name. But there's also a key kind of moment, particularly towards the end of the text, um, that develops gradually as a theme all the way through about the impossibility of speaking about the necessity of silence, about the intimacy of that relationship between silence and subjectivity um, that also may well be of some important, important sort of relevance when thinking about the name John the Silent. And so this, this, this kind of problem of paradox, in particular paradoxical knowledge, in, and in particular our relationship to knowledge when we're in that paradoxical situation is right at the heart of fear and trembling and as I say applies not just to the situation of Abraham but to anyone in an analogous situation um, and saying so it's in a sense this that's going to enable us to sort of transform uh, as I as I will be doing um, fear and trembling from a, a religious text that focuses on God um, to a philosophical text that focuses on subjectivity um, and whilst the former reading, if you want to religi read it religiously, is absolutely fine, because this is a philosophy class, we're, we're, we're focused less on the theology and more on the concept. And at the heart of that conceptual work um, is the relationship to the subject subjectivity. And so that, I think, um, that relationship to the subject paradox and silence is something absolutely crucial that we need to bear in mind right at the beginning of our reading and frame our reading in such a way as that we feel like we're reading a play and that we understand that that play has a false author, it has a stage situation, it has a series of characters and it has a particular kind of dynamic and we should approach the work um, in that way. Um, the reason for that we'll get back to it's connected as i've mentioned before to this idea of indirect communication but for now let's take a break let's take a five minute break stretch yourself uh, have a bit of a relax and um after which we'll have a brief look at the structure of the text that we're, we're beginning to work on and then we'll have a look at some of the basic things
Okay, so I'm gonna go back to it a bit. This is the second part of the lecture tonight. And um, what I wanna look at next is the structure of the text. And I don't wanna do this in any great uh, conceptual detail. Um, but what I asked uh, students to do, what I ask people in the class to do, is to read up to the start of the Problematas, which is the first sort of four or so sections of the book, which is quite a lot of reading. Um, and so I want to just take us through those sections and take us through the, the sort of broad structure of the book so that we can, um, having like done a bit of that reading and maybe finishing it off in the week to come, so we can have a sense of where we're at. We can get a sense of the, of the topography, the lay of the land of the text which will enable us to um, both hopefully think about the text a bit better, um, but also find our way through it quite practically. Um, so that's in a sense all this is. It's not going to be some deep um, you know, deconstruction of the text on the basis of its structure at the moment. This is a much more practical um, pedagogic thing of like, you know, here's the structure, <laughs> this is the notes you need to think about. So let's have a look through some of these in, in these bits. Um, what we've got... There's a series of important points that we need to just pay attention to, okay? Um, so first of all, we've got the pseudonymous authorship that I've mentioned, where the author of the text is John the Silent, not Kierkegaard. So the whole text, including its author, including its title, every single element of this text is part of a kind of presentation. Um, it's a staging. Um, as I say, it's a bit like a play. Something's being staged for us in order to give us that figurative expression. Now, aside from the pseudonymous authorship, there's also, as anyone who's begun to read the text should should probably realise by now quite quickly, um, there is also uh, what is plainly a kind of um, deeply rhetorical method. The way in which language is used occasionally is quite beautiful, but quite often it is, is um, almost baroque. It's very, very... Uh, the word prolix comes to mind, long-winded. It's quite long-winded, it goes around the houses, it does all sorts of odd things that don't immediately appear to be reasonable, <laughs> don't immediately appear to be part of a philosophy text. Um, and it, it changes pace, it changes tack, it changes voice, it seems to have a whole series of different things going on, particularly in the opening pages of the text where you've moved through the preface and then you move through these series of little stagings of of the Abraham story with Sarah, uh, with the lessons about weaning, um, into a kind of eulogy, a praise moment of Abraham, followed by a kind of first encounter with some of the philosophical problems around faith um, in the preamble. And because of that staging, because of that whole package thing, it's also in easy to to miss certain things some things very very easy to miss the title and the epigram um, we don't even notice them quite often when reading books as it as philosophers we should pay close attention to epigrams whenever they pop up um, they're a tool inside philosophy for kind of making an illusion uh, making a connection giving a tone introducing an ethos into a work um, uh, and sometimes simply locating us and in um Fear and Trembling, not only is there the title, Fear and Trembling, a dialectical lyric, um, so that kind of notion, that dialectic lyric, that subtitle well, can easily be forgotten there, um, but there's also a little a little epigram, the story of Tarquinus, the story of the cutting of the poppy heads. Um, now this is a particular kind of story that is, in a sense, taken to illustrate what we mean by indirect communication, and as such... Uh, stands as a kind of alert point to say this whole text, Fear and Trembling, is to do with indirect communication and in a sense is an indirect communication itself, quite possibly. What does indirect communication mean here in the, in the, in the case of the epigram? Well, um, it's a messenger that's been sent. It's just, I'll, describe it, I'll describe it inaccurately but as succinctly as possible. There's a town that's under siege um, uh, by by an enemy, um, uh, an ally town um, outside of this siege sends a messenger in, manages to get a messenger in, and the messenger's message is to go up to local flowers. When he gets to the to the you know the the, the person who's receiving the message, is to go to the, the local the, the flower heads by it in the flower bed, 
to take his sword out and to cut the heads off the flowers. Um, and the person in the besieged town is the son of the king who sent the messenger. And so the son is faced with this strange message, you know, that seems to be very odd. Um, you know, literally, the messenger says, I was told to do this. I was told to chop the heads off the flowers. Um, and the son's like, well, what the hell is that about? Now, obviously, the town the son is in is under siege. Messengers could be intercepted. This has been sent from the outside, managed to get through. Um, and even if it was intercepted, this is absolutely crucial about the notion of indirect communication. Even if it was in intercepted, it could not be understood. There is a kind of simple, singular recipient, the son, for this message from the king. And only this particular context um, of the siege and of the king's relationship to the son and of the son knowing something important about this message, only the context can drive the son's reception of this message. Um, and the son realises that what he means is that uh, he should execute the heads, the, f the top flowers, as it were, of his city in order to you know, get rid of the infiltration and curb the rebellion or curb the siege. And so it takes, it takes the action. Now that kind of indirect communication, that message sent in such a way that only the recipient could possibly understand it. There's no possibility of cracking the code, as it were. Um, that is a kind of crucial relationship that we need to begin to think about um, in terms of fear and trembling because this in a sense is part of uh, the methodology of indirect communication so the title and the epigram whilst tiny and small you know 50 100 words less um, can be quickly skipped over but their importance is, in, is, is kind of crucial in many ways and then the bits that people have been asked to read uh, so you begin to get into um, in in the translation that I've given the students uh, on River, which is the Hong and Hong translation, uh, these sections are called the preface, the exordium, the eulogy, and then the preliminary expectoration. The worst names you could possibly consider in some ways. Um, preface is obvious, and exordium. I mean, these the eulogy. Perhaps we know about that's from from funerals and preliminary expectoration. I mean, these are very strange terms. Um, but in different translations, they get different. Uh, they get different terms of translation. So one alternate translation gives them as the preface. Um, it calls the exordium the attunement. It calls the eulogy the speech in praise of Abraham. And it calls the prelim preliminary expectoration the preamble from the heart. That's uh, Alistair Hanley's translation, the Penguin edition. And in another translation, it's called the preface, the tuning up, a tribute to Abraham and a preliminary outpouring from the heart. That's the, the Cambridge edition. And so... They have a slightly, you know, you know, a variance in translation here, which is unsurprising in many ways because they're quite poetic terms. Um, but there are basically these four particular sections. There's this little preface in which he talks about the way in which people go, um, so go so easily further than everything in the in every now and then nowadays. There, that's the preface. Then there's the exordium or the attunement or the tuning up, and that's where we have the various different stories of Abraham on the way to the mount. Um, and that includes the little lessons about weaning the child from the mother. Um, then we have the eulogy, which deals in a sense with the poet's relationship to the hero. How it is possible to write and speak of um, the hero Abraham. And then we have the preliminary expectoration or the you know preliminary outpouring from the heart or the preamble from the heart, which is essentially the starting point for the problem that... Um, the text is encountering when it encounters Abraham. So that whole first four sections that I've asked people to read this week and which I'll allow people to sort of continue reading in the next week, that whole first four sections is all about setting up the framework. It's all about trying to, to establish a series uh, of like um, boundaries um, within which this particular work is operating. And it's also crucially setting up the character of John the Silent. Because we read this text very, as I say, very easily as though it's coming out of Kierkegaard's mouth. But what we're actually reading as we read those first four sections are the establishment of a particular kind of character. And it'd be important to ask what that kind of character is in a moment. At the end of the text, well, in the second half of the text, if you like, um, the character that's been established in the first four parts, 
the character that's been established by talking about Abraham in these various different ways, that character then begins to explore the question of Abraham more directly, philosophically, as it were, in a more recognisably philosophical way. So in what are called problemata, and there are three of them, um, we encounter three kind of discrete philosophical problems. The first problem is called the teleological suspension of the ethical. Um, and this is a kind of tension between ethics and religion. In the second, we encounter the problem of duty, in particular a kind of uh, duty that we might have to faith or duty that we might have, I suppose, in some ways to reason even. And in the third, the emphasis is on communicability and silence. So the structure of the, the, structure of the text is, is kind of important, particularly when you're reading those first few sections, because what you're reading is, in a sense, the, the character that you are hearing. You are reading into existence the character that you are hearing as you go through that. So it's important to try and allow that character to develop. Now, the other things that are kind of important, the text is overall structured by the authorial voice or intention of John the Silent. He's constantly focusing us on his attempt to understand Abraham in this situation, constantly pushing, and he presents as this person of a particular type. And so it's important to try and realise that that's you know, um, that's John the Silent. What kind of person is John the Silent? Well, he's someone who cannot make the movement of faith. He says this explicitly. He's someone who wants to be able to, which he also says explicitly. And he encounters this particular problem in which reason is not capable of enabling such a movement of faith. Um, and the reason it's not capable of doing that is because uh, such a movement is singular. It's not... The movement of a collective or a universal or a group or it's not the it's not the movement of a, a reasonable argument that persuades you to you know have faith it's a movement that is singular that is located deeply inside the subject in their specific relationship um, and crucially one of the things we might want to ask is 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 fear and trembling a work of reasoning is what it's doing actually philosophy it, it, and the answer to that is is Yes and no. I mean, it's a very, very curious situation. In a classical sense, philosophy is always engaged with poetry, presentation, theatricality, figures, characters, um, whether it be Hume, whether it be Plato. There's a whole series of spaces in which philosophy has kind of told its story through characters, through dialectics between those characters. And so in a sense, Kierkegaard is not out of place um, within philosophy, but what does seem difficult sometimes is uh, that we are kind of presented with what are plainly at, at certain points look like arguments, but at the same time feel like something else. Um, now, is fear and trembling a work of reasoning? If we think of reasoning as objective reason, to refer back to the lecture last week, then no, it's not a work of objective reasoning. But it is Kierkegaard, I think, would argue, and I would argue, it is a work of reasoning if we take reasoning to be the increase of a capacity. Reasoning enables us to increase our capacity to deal with something. Um, and in this situation, fear and trembling is a work of reasoning that enables us to increase our capacity to deal with paradox in particular. Um, and specifically the paradox of faith, but by analogy, we might want to extend this to uh, a wider encounter with paradoxical situations. And it does this not by presenting objective arguments that kind of call upon us to submit to them, but by producing the experience that I mentioned last week of reduplication. Um, so this is the experience of kind of having it yourself, uh, you know, taking it in and re-experiencing not what it is that Abraham is, is experiencing, not what it is necessarily that even John the Silent is experiencing, but the kind of process of being caught inside that paradox that both Abraham and John the Silent embody for us. And so this is, you know, this is why encountering fear and trembling can be a difficult kind of, of text, because while we can find clear and simple propositions all over the text, clear and simple philosophically looking propositions all over that text, the actual practice of the text, the intention of the text, is not to enable us to sort of pick a proposition and argue about it. It's to begin to, to develop our capacities, to enable us to learn something. Um, and at the heart of the problem is this, this relationship to subjectivity. The experience of subjectivity 
is most intimately one of singularity. This is a kind of background idea, I think, that's crucial to existentialists more broadly. Um, and because the experience of subjectivity is most intimately one of singularity, because that singularity is a kind of privacy, because at the heart of that there's this problem of silence and communicability, um, then relying upon words, relying upon language to be able to communicate this is, is missing huge chunks of what that singularity of the subject is. Essentially, relying upon the intellect to access uh, subjectivity is to forget that subjectivity as singular is not simply an intellect. It's a body. It's a situation. It's a whole series of ensnarements and contracts and contacts and it's emo I mean, I mean in, in, in more philosophical terms or in conceptual terms it's uh, the dialectic must be lyrical if, if, if we wanted to try and let's say reconstruct why Kierkegaard might call it a dialectical lyric the dialectical the dialectic must be lyrical because it must be uh, expressing emotion it must be expression affect it must be embodied it must be one that grips us and this is going to be crucial when we encounter the relationship to to Abraham. The problem with Abraham is not that we can't understand it, not that we can't, as it were, give an account of this. For John the Silent, the problem is that we have to be able to access the shudder at the heart of the moment. Not the reason for what he did, but that shudder of paradox, the shudder that's right at the heart of the Abrahamic moment, and the shudder that in a sense is going to be by analogy uh, at the heart of a kind of paradoxical relationship to our own subjectivity. So what I'm going to do now, I would say, uh, take another break, but actually I'm going to leave it a little bit. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to drop down the presentation now. We don't need that anymore. Um, ooh, and we don't need that. So let's just put this back up. So what I'm going to do now is just um, just touch on a few themes before we finish, right, so we can begin to get some of our thinking as you as you're working through the text, as you're reading through the text, you can begin to get some of your thinking kind of um, coordinated around some themes. Now there's a lot of them, and you could pick a whole series of different things out of Fear and Trembling. It's an incredibly rich text, um, but I just want to pick out four themes. And I'll begin to come back to these at different points in time during the course. Um, first of all, obviously, is the theme of faith. Uh, and here, uh, faith, obviously, is orientated in relationship to God. It's orientated in relationship to the Abrahamic religion and this kind of experience of God. But we don't need to um, simply limit it to that kind of situation. Uh, any kind of experience of faith or experience of something beyond knowledge um, is going to be in, going to be involved here, um, and uh, we'll look at this in, as I say, in more detail. But this kind of experience of faith is uh, something that occurs at a particular kind of moment in time. Let's say when knowledge no longer can give us cause for action; um, it can just simply give us reasons why we might act one way or another, but it can't decide between them. Uh, at a certain point, perhaps, um, the faith in a particular possibility. Um, let's say in politics, for example, the faith in a particular possibility um, is going to, you know, um, be more important in a sense than the reasons themselves. And so we're kind of situated in a position of faith, not just when we come across religious discourse in terms of God, but also when we come to the question of what do we do, how do we act in relationship to our knowledge. Quite often, knowledge, knowledge itself, isn't going to give us sufficient reasons to act one way rather than another, rather than another and quite often what we will end up doing um, is um, presenting a reason for an action as though it were a cause when in fact it's a kind of excuse or it's a kind of explanation it almost in a sense generally the reason we give for why we do something um, is not the cause for why we do it it's often something that comes afterwards and is some sort of way of us you know, giving an account of why we're doing something rather than producing the action itself and so there's a relationship to faith and action that's kind of crucial here that doesn't just um, limit itself to the theological domain and that theme of faith obviously in the count in the countenance and in the figure of abraham is a central theme obviously throughout fear and trembling that should kind of go without saying almost um, the second theme that i've touched upon at the start of this lecture 
and that it is um, absolutely, I think, vital to consider because it involves the staging of the text, it involves the way in which we kind of encounter the arguments in the text and the way in which we encounter um, Kierkegaard's work generally. That second theme is, is silence and communicability. Um, and here, instead of Abraham being the figure, the idea of indirect communication is kind of the, the concept that we want to work with, perhaps, to try and understand or begin to explore how fear and trembling um, says something important or interesting about silence and communicability, particularly in regard to subjectivity. The third theme is uh, a theme that's, that's huge inside philosophy in many ways, and yet at the same time often placed kind of on the side as a, as a sort of... Um, as a sort of minor interest and this is the theme of possibility and necessity um, what are the limits of the possible what are the limits of the necessary um, now the reason this is a theme is because of something like uh, the following proposition Kierkegaard wants to understand us understand uh, the, the relationship to Abraham um, and yet he encounters when he encounters the relationship to Abraham a kind of uh, a position um, that goes beyond reason and in particular it goes beyond reason because of the kind of statement like the following in God all things are possible um, now this kind of core theological statement presents an incredible problem for philosophy because the inverse of in God all things are possible um, might be something like nothing is impossible or even nothing is necessary, um, nothing has to happen, nothing needs to follow a particular law, nothing is written down in stone. However you want to write this, the idea is that there's a kind of um, uh, immediate theological faith that we might have with the statement of something like, in God all things are possible, but there's an enormous complication um, that arises if we take that seriously. Um, if we have faith, for example, in that statement as true, then huge possibilities uh, begin to arise as to you know an extension of the limits of what can happen in the world. And crucially, this is central to this relationship to Abraham and Isaac. What what uh, Kierkegaard wants to be able to present to us in, in, by through the through the, through the voice and language of John the Silent and the whole framing of the text is a situation in which we take absolutely seriously the idea that. Um, Abraham has not uh, reasoned himself out of the horror of what he's doing. But more importantly, his faith has enabled him to get to a position in which he can both know that he's going to kill his son and know at the same time that his son is not going to be killed. Now that kind that's a kind of that that's a paradoxical situation. That's this like why we're talking about the archetype of the paradox situation. And what is central to fear and trembling is not allowing us through any reasoning that we might want to make or any kind of excuses that we might find to take Abraham out of that paradox. We want to encounter him in the heart of that paradox. And at the heart of that paradox is this theme uh, of um, in God all things are possible and this relationship between possibility and necessity. And closely connected to that is the fourth theme, um, which is the relationship between the eternal and the temporal. Now, the realm of spirit and God, these things that are eternal, um, that's kind of, and this eternal realm, also the, inf the realm of the infinite, um, this is kind of a crucial realm that, that is posited inside John, John's um, text here. He obviously kind of takes it very seriously, as no doubt did Kierkegaard. Um, and if you're not a theological person, if you're not a religious person, it might be difficult for us to take that quite so seriously. Um, and so we'll have to look maybe a little bit more detail at quite how we encounter uh, this relationship between the eternal and the temporal, um, between the infinite and the finite. But let's just, I mean, for, for a, in, in a kind of simple way, let's just take the idea that... that um, Mathematical laws, for example, or geometrical laws, what sometimes encounter in philosophy under the name of the a priori, these are um, not temporally restricted. They aren't going to change given a particular date. They are, for all, atten all, all, all intents and purposes, eternal. They are the kind of statements 
um, the mathematical and geometrical statements you know uh, they are the kind of statements that are uh, outside of time in a way and so we don't just simply need to deal with some sort of special spiritual realm we also are dealing with anything that is kind of that kind of grips takes on a character of or has a sort of sense of um not contingent not just here in this particular context but true for time true true simpliciter just true not true in the 20th century true in the 21st century true in the particular context of western europe or anything like that but just true full stop um, and that relationship to the infinite and the eternal is kind of very analogous to the relationship that we might want to have or we might want to think through um, the two truth and uh, statements such as the a priori that appear to be kind of outside of time so those four themes of faith silence and communication possibility and necessity and the eternal and the temporal these are all kind of core themes and in particular those first two um I would urge people when they're reading through the text to really sort of begin to kind of try and categorize or think about what's being said in terms of those first two themes of faith and silence. Now I also want to just briefly before we finish tonight um, talk about this notion of indirect communication and use an example that Kierkegaard gives which is the example of swimming, learning to swim. Let's see if we can just bring this up for you. Um, This is a short part. Remember, this is John the Silent talking. So he says, for my part, this is John the Silent, I presumably can describe the movements of faith, but I cannot make them. In learning to go through the motions of swimming, one can be suspended from the ceiling in a harness and then presumably describe the movements, but one is not swimming. In the same way, I can describe the movements of faith. If I am thrown out into the water, I presumably do swim, for I do not belong to the waders, but I make different movements, the movements of infinity, whereas faith makes the opposite movements. After having made the movements of infinity, it makes the movements of finitude. Now, the stuff around towards the end there where he's talking about these different movements, this is going to be expressed in particular in terms of um, the knights of faith and the knights of resignation. These are the key characters that kind of develop and express this relationship or these different relationships one can have um, to the eternal and the temporal. But what's important maybe about this example that he gives is just the relationship to learning here, how it is we're capable of learning. Now, this is, this is from the Routledge Guide. Uh, to Kierkegaard by John Lippitt. His view, this is Lippitt, his view that people exist, Kierkegaard's view, that people exist in various states of confusion or illusion. He thinks that such illusions can only be dispelled by bringing people around to recognise from their own inner experience their perhaps unconscious reasons for adopting a particular view of the world and way of living. This in turn can only be done by entering imaginatively into their point of view, showing empathy with the emotional foundations on which it rests. Kierkegaard, speaking in his own voice, claims that an illusion can never be removed directly and basically only indirectly. One who is under an illusion must be approached from behind. Now this, these kind of two elements, these elements of, um, let's say, the, the, the swimming lesson, or how it is we might learn something, um, and the insufficiency of description to learning, and this uh, difficulty of dispelling illusion. So, you know, the, the need to kind of sneak behind the back, the need to kind of present things in a particular way to try and empathetically get into that particular point of view. These two relationships between learning and, you know, pe dispelling people's illusions. It's in response to the difficulties of learning and the difficulties of dispelling people's illusion that the method of indirect communication comes about. It's, and, and fear and trembling as an expression of that method of indirect communication is uh, something that is trying to teach us how to learn something, not swimming in this case, perhaps faith, but it's also trying to um, enable us to begin to see the unconscious what he calls the unconscious reasons for adopting a particular view of the world um, and maybe a view of the world that actually is a bit closer 
to John the Silence than we perhaps would like to admit, in which even if we want to be religious, we're perhaps still in the position of John the Silent, or more importantly, even if maybe we want to believe in the future, a you know, future uh, of, of the world beyond a, a capitalist situation in which we end up with crises like we have, if we want to believe in that, if we want to have faith in that kind of future, we kind of have to be able to engage uh, um, with this particular point of view of the world. And so Fear and Trembling is a book that in a sense is presented to us um, as uh, a gateway, as a way in which we can begin to learn, we can begin to increase our capacity perhaps for faith, um, uh, rather than know something uh, at the end of it, um, we should be able to do something. Whether that's possible, whether that's clear is going to be a question for another day. Um, right, so that's the end of the lecture today. I'm going to be opening up the seminar for the Free University of Brighton people now. Um, I would be uh, happy to see anyone around, obviously, on uh, Discord if you want to ask questions and you're not in the Free University of Brighton. Otherwise, um, catch you again next week when we'll be looking at some more Kierkegaard. If you're doing a reading, make sure you try and have read up to, um, if possible, the end of the first Problemata, but definitely the first four sections by next week. Um, and we'll begin looking at that first Problemata in the context of the character of John the Silent and those first four sections. So I'll catch you next week. See you later.